Um, we've already introduced myself. I'm awesome. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> uh, so I think before we get into the topic of adaptability, I think it's important for us uh, to talk about what the, cha the word change means to you. As we talked about before, I have a very introvert friendly, but also extrovert friendly, it's just really friendly, um, online polling tool. Uh, I'd love for you to log in. You can use the QR code or you can manually type it in at the top, menti.com. There's a code to use. And I'd like you to log in and tell me what change means to you. This is the first of many interactive um, questions I'll be asking through this app. But if you feel more comfortable using your voice loud and proud, by all means. There we go. Change means different from now, necessary growth, when something goes from how it was to another way, they're not the same as before, new opportunities, uncertainty and risk, product owner and inference, moving to a different way of being, mutation, okay, I like that one, switch one. doing something different, learning something new and applying it, doing something uncomfortable. So we see a couple of positive, quote unquote, and negative, quote unquote, items up here. Something new, new opportunities, but also uncertainty, risk. Sometimes I often see scary up there. Now I'm going to use the big F word, feelings. Uh, that's what the F word is uh, for at a tech conference is feelings. So how does change make you feel? And there's no wrong answer here. Excited, pressure, afraid, fearful, nervous, unsecure. <laughs> you haven't felt it in years. Or you haven't felt in years, I think is what I said. Uh, unsettled, anxiety. Depends on what's changing. Okay. Um, a lot of anxiety going on. Yeah, it creates a, a lot of pain. And actually, change activates the pain center of our brain. If you don't believe me, Google it. You'll find a whole bunch of people talking, <laughs> talking about it. Um, and, you know, I like to think of myself as a pretty adaptable person um, for, you know, I talk about it a lot, right? I like to think that I'm really adaptable. But I had a couple of big changes happen to me that, um, that helped me realize that maybe I don't always show up as adaptable as I'd like to be. Um, so in the past, you know, roughly year, year and a half, I've had a lot of big changes. Um, I... I uh, um, I moved in with somebody after living alone for 13 years. I got a new job uh, or company via acquisition. I got a new boss. I got COVID and then realized I had long COVID and realized I couldn't do as much as I thought that I was able to do or I couldn't do as much as I could do before I got COVID and long COVID. Um, and then I moved into a new house, a smart house, where you had to use Alexa, or as I call her, effing Alexa. Um, and as you can imagine, um, by just what I call her, that, that was the biggest change for me is I had all these major life events. I got engaged. I moved into a house. I moved in with a partner after 13 years. And the thing that made me show up as not adaptable was having to use my voice to turn on a light switch. I did not show up as adaptable and my fiance, my partner can attest to that. Um, you know, when we talk about adaptability, we're, we're not talking about being Pollyannish through the change. We're not supposed to, me we're not meant to smile through this change, right? We're not going to. Again, an act of change activates the pain center of your brain. And with that, you're, you're not gonna show up um, with a smile on your face. Um, and, and changes can be big or small, right? Turning, using Alexa, using your voice to turn on a light seems like a really small change, but I still struggle with it to this day, but I'm really trying, right? Um, and that's, that's the point here is how do we, how do we adapt without it wrecking our world? And everyone's response is different. And so let's talk a little bit about why, why that is. Um, so your situation is just as much a function of you as you are of it. And we don't even really wanna talk about what happens um, when we throw other people into the mix. Because what this diagram is, is here to show is that um, you know, our reactions are really unique um, because the person their environment and their behavior can continuously influence one another. And it's this swirling around that results in our response, meaning that our behavior is internally and externally controlled. So your environment influences you, your value and beliefs influence your behavior, and your behavior influences your environment. 
And this happens in all kinds of different patterns and combinations. And so if this happens without us even being aware of it, imagine what we could do if we harness this. Imagine if we made a conscious effort to influence these changes. Imagine what we could do if we focused on adaptability and improving it. And so let's face it, changes big and small are not going away. Um, nothing is more permanent than change itself. And as you saw on our previous slide, that mere, merely existing in the world makes you an actor in all kinds of patterns and combinations, some we aren't even aware of. We are complex, the world is complex, and our response is just as complex. And so to further explain this, I could talk about VUCA, Kneffin, complexity theory, um, or I, again, I could just say COVID. Um, I really like you explaining complexity, uh, the feeling of complexity through the example of COVID because it's something that we all experience together. Um, and soon I'm going to be updating this talk, probably in about six months, about what it was like to embrace AI, generative AI. AI. I think that's going to be a really great example of how we're embracing AI and being adaptable through that change. So, but since we've, we've all gone through the COVID experience, right? Adjusted and adapted to this new way of living. Um, let's, let's go back and remember what it was like day one, day 30, of, uh, day 60 of COVID, um, or even a day 365 of COVID. Remember how we were um, encouraged to sanitize all of our groceries? And then you had to, I, I know I left my FedEx package and bake in the sun for a day because heaven help, help me, I was going to die if I opened it without doing that. And then one day, I just didn't need to do any of that, right? And then it was okay to wear cloth masks. I spent a lot of time making cloth masks. And then one day, those weren't enough. So cloth, ma cloth masks were out the door. And, and uh, the complexity of the world really means that there are many interactions between people and their environment. Things change at such a rapid rate. Our ability to understand the present changes as we learn new information. So our ability to understand today changes as we learn new information. And this is why we should not always seek the same, because things aren't the way they were. They can't stay the way they are. And so I'm going to go through an example about um, hand washing. Let's see how this plays out. So hand, we all know that hand washing is vital to keeping us safe, safe and stopping the spread of infections. Well, um, and we, we also hope, can, I keep trying to walk away from this thing, but it won't let me. Uh, we hope that our, our doctors will wash their hands before they see us, right? Um, well, before um, 1860 or around 1860, doctors didn't believe in hand washing. Who knew that? A lot of people. Okay, cool. So you guys know this story. Um, for those of you who don't, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But they didn't believe in hand washing. Not even after performing an autopsy would they wash their hands. They just go next to the next living patient. Ew, right? A collective ew. Um, but then this Hungarian doctor came along. I can't pronounce his name, so I put it up there for you guys to pronounce it um, in your head. And uh, he recommended that we should doctors should be washing uh, hands before seeing patients. And he did a little bit of research and said, doing this will decrease the mortality rate by, to, to around 1%, which is like huge, right? Um, but guess what his peers did? Yeah, they shunned him. Shunned him so bad that he went to an asylum with a nervous breakdown over, over washing hands. And why is this? Does anybody remember why, why this is? Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know that part, but they, they believed it was all deaths were caused by bad gas. Um, the, the story that I have is that they thought that uh, gentlemen's hands were clean and doctors are gentlemen, so their hands are clean, right? We're all laughing because that's old information, right? We live in a new world today. We know more things. Your, uh, so your environment influences you. Your beliefs and values influence your behavior. Gentlemen's hands are clean. And, and your behavior influences your environment, I'm going to ignore cold, hard facts, right? Um, and, and, you know, our, I think it's really, again, important for me to, to talk about how our ability to understand the present changes as we learn new information. So uh, Bandura, who's a social psychiatrist or psychologist, uh, um, you, uh, you might remember him from like the Boho social learning experiments. Um, but he suggests that when in times of change, people either cultivate their environment 
or they resist and fight for control. So those doctors fought for control in the face of facts. They weren't thriving. This poor doctor wasn't thriving. The patients weren't thriving. The adaptability was low. So how does this relate to you? Um, as I mentioned before, being able to respond to change increases positive workplace outcomes. So those raises that you want, those promotions, being able to work on those fun, exciting projects. Your adaptability is directly related to, to that. Um, and, you know, why is change so hard if we're clearly rewarded for it, right? If we're, if we're rewarded for being adaptable, why is it so hard for us? Um, and, and, it's, and it's really hard. I think these hand-washing examples, COVID, really show how challenging it is for us to change to a new normal. And because it's hard, I have a favorite way of thinking about adaptability, and I borrow it from Taoism. And it's how water works. So water uh, takes on three different states, right? Um, and, uh, but each time it changes, it's still the same three atoms. It adapts to the changing pressures in the environment to take on a new shape. Water doesn't resist the change happening around it. Water doesn't change its core elements. Water adapts. And it's this liminal phase shift, this change energy that really, really fascinates me. And you feel this change energy with an upset stomach right before a first date or a job interview. You feel this change energy right before when maybe somebody comes up to you after a meeting and says, hey, I have some feedback on that meeting that you did. Hopefully they don't say it like that. Maybe they say, hey, I have some feedback for that meeting that you just went. Um, or you feel it right before you're going to give a talk to a bunch of people on adaptability. And this change energy is what we really want to harness. And so uh, often at this point, people start to think, OK, well, I'm a knowledge worker. I'm a creative worker. I can just use those skills. Um, harness those skills and adapt to any kind of change. Well, the thing about it is AQ, adaptability quotient, and IQ are not necessarily correlated, and emotional quotient isn't necessarily a good indicator of somebody's adaptability either. So I said a lot of cues. Let's do a quick recap of our cues. So here are, here, here are three cues. We have uh, intellectual quotient, um, your, uh, your reasoning ability and problem solving skills. You have EQ, that's your ability to understand, regulate and adjust your emotions. And AQ, what we're gonna be talking about today is your ability to adapt and thrive in an environment of change. So having one high Q doesn't necessarily mean all of your Qs are high. Um, IQ, EQ and AQ all play together and none of them are fixed. And we don't lean on IQ, EQ, AQ the same in each situation. So I really like this quote by Natalie Ferrato. It says, IQ is the minimum you need to get a job, but AQ is what you need to be successful over time. Ferrato then went on to say, AQ is, is not just the capacity to absorb new information, but you need to figure out what's relevant. You need to be able to unlearn obsolete information. You need to persist through challenges, really over, work to overcome them, and make a conscious effort to change. Because AQ involves flexibility, curiosity, courage, resiliency, and problem-solving skills. So I imagine at this point you're like, cool, what's my, what's my AQ? Just give me the formula. Uh, I wanna know, give me the numbers, data. Um, and so we're gonna do that. Um, I, I have a uh, QR code up here that's gonna take you to a test. Um, it, it, there is no one way to measure adaptability quotient. If you Google it, you're gonna find 15 to 1,000 different ways to measure adaptability. Um, I take a more scientific approach. I like the Bateman and Krantz um, survey that they do. It's proactive personality scale. And so we made it really easy for you to take that right now. So it's an assessment that will walk you through a handful of questions of where you currently stand from an AQ perspective and various situations. I want you to respond honestly, right? It can be really easy for you to be like, eh, I do a really good job uh, to get a high score. The score isn't the thing. It's a measurement, it's a smell to help us understand where we might be in a spectrum. And if you're done, go ahead and if you feel comfortable, share your score here. Um, this is anonymous. 
Uh, and as some people are still filling it out, I'll share a little bit about my score since I'm asking you to do yours. I took this around a year and a half ago um, and I got a 61. I took it today and I got a 79. Seems a little weird, right? Not really though, because AQ is not fixed. AQ is something that we're continuously working on and it's not a competition. If, if, if you're looking at this and comparing yourself among others in the crowd, you're doing it wrong. Okay, this is, it's like yoga. It's your own personal experience. It's more of a smell um, than, than actual cold, hard fact. So uh, it's less of a grade and more of a signal that indicates how adaptable you are given it the current environment and situation. If your score is on the higher side, I think 85 is the max, you're more likely to look at opportunities, embrace them, experiment, and innovate. If you're scoring on the lower side, you may instead react by seeking out stability and retreating from the change. Both are okay. Even if you haven't taken the assessment, you know, uh, there could be some other external signals circling around you saying that you might kind of be struggling with adaptability. So, yeah, and these are typically typical to the, the, the numbers I see. All right, so now, now you know what you are, right? You know where your score is currently. That can change. Go ahead, yeah, you have a question? It can, uh, I forget how some of the questions are worded related to that, but it's really about um, the, how you respond to those outcomes, right? So one of the things about adaptability is persisting through change. And I don't know if everyone heard uh, what this gentleman was saying, but how do outcomes impact our score, right? How is that a measurement of adaptability? And if you're, if you're embracing the environment, you're embracing in this change, let's say it's, it's uh, generative AI. Um, and you, you, don't, you don't know engineering prompts, right? Um, and you're, so you're not getting a really great outcome. Do you throw up your hands and say, well, I'm not an engineer, I can't do it, uh, this isn't for me? Or do you start to learn? Um, maybe you go to you know, um, a boot camp or just Google engineering prompts online. And so I think that's how it, it, it ties in, it, into, into what your adaptability is. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of their adaptability and resilience are, aren't interchangeable. One is how you persevere through a problem or uh, through adversity, and another is how you thrive and change. But they, they can kind of feel the same on the surface, but yeah. Um, so we're starting to understand, oh yeah. Would you say that resistance is the, op the opposite of adaptability? Oh, what would you say? I would. Yeah? Why? No, I wouldn't actually come to think of it. Because originally I was thinking resisting change could be the opposite of adapting. So you could actually want to adapt it. Oh, say that again. I thought originally that uh, resistance was opposing change. Resistance is opposing the change. change. You just want a different change. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of these words, uh, resist, resistance, resilience, adaptability, kind of swim in the same pond maybe i'm gonna go i'm gonna stretch in an, in an analogy here so go with me um but maybe some of it's allergy uh, allergy uh, algae <laughs> so you some of it's fish i mean some of it's plants they're all kind of needed and you might say oh those are all things that are in a pond um but they all have unique unique characteristics but i think they play together adaptability though keep in mind is really about thriving in change okay um so we're starting to understand about adaptability, right? Uh, uh, we understand that it's hard. We understand the mindset about uh, being adaptable, kind of be like water. And you know your score. So let's dig into an example. Uh, again, I like to talk about COVID because I think it's a shared experience that uh, was really a catalyst for change that we all experienced together. But there are other changes that you likely experience. I know I shared some of mine, but maybe your team is going through using a new tool, a new tech stack, uh, maybe you had, a, you know, an illness, maybe you got your gallbladder out and now you're adjusting to the world without a gallbladder, food you can't eat, exercise you can't do, work that you can't do. Um, or maybe, maybe it's this talk, right? Maybe this is your first go-to. Maybe this is your first conference ever. Maybe it's your first time using Menti. And adaptability quotient really is a key role for getting us through these changes successfully. So what I want to do, though, is walk through a specific example, right? So you know your score you know some of the feelings of what it looks like. Let's look like what somebody with high adaptability, how they would respond to generative AI. So 
Generative AI is relatively new on the scene um, and it's growing exponentially. What is here today will not be what is tomorrow, right? We're learning and getting new information and it's maturing at such a fast rate. Um, and if you aren't uh, familiar with generative AI, it involves training a machine uh, with learning patterns and characteristics for a, a given data set, and then taking that and coming out with unique um, and um, previously unseen examples that re resemble that same data set. Can you hear me when I do this? Okay. Uh, I, as, I, as I mentioned, I'm a swayer, I'm a dancer up here, and I don't know how that's impacting your experience out there. Um, <laughs> okay. So uh, generative AI is really threatening a lot of different fields right now. And um, it can feel really daunting and it can even feel really scary about how do you incorporate generative AI into your workflow? Because you're going to need to do it if you haven't already done it. And that can feel really scary. So let's, let's imagine we're all high adaptable people uh, and let's, how, how would somebody like that respond in this situation? So how, how do you guys think somebody who is highly adaptable will respond to generative AI? Yeah, Karina. You learn it. Yeah. You start, you try it, try to figure out how to use it, get frustrated with it, <laughs> Say the P word. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you, you scan for opportunities. You find ways to leverage this new technology. Maybe you, you realize that you can use it to do some of your research. Maybe it can write an article for you. Maybe it can proofread an article for you. Maybe it can actually read and summarize an article that is way too long for you to consume, right? <laughs> there are a whole bunch of different ways for you to be able to use this new technology, but unless you're scanning for opportunities, you're never gonna be able to find out how to embrace this change, how to engage in this particular change. And that's what people who are highly adaptable do. They scan for opportunities to embrace the change. People who are highly adaptable also utilize resources. So maybe you connected with somebody that you met at the last GoTo conference. Maybe you'll connect with somebody at this GoTo conference that's really excited and eager about AI. Or maybe you do what we do at 3Cloud here, uh, or 3Cloud, is that we have um, open, open AI office hours where we talk about how we're embracing this change and we're building di different um, protocols and practices surrounding AI to really incorporate it in, into our workflow. And people who are highly adaptable persist through change. So maybe you host a lunch and learn twice a week where you talk about the capabilities of AI. Or maybe you talk to your senior leaders and, and sit with them through the uncomfortability of this new tool and the corporate security policies and how it might impact them. The really important thing here is that people who are highly adaptable persist through change. They don't give up after the first 10 people who are complaining about it or the first 100 people that are complaining about it or the first 150 people who are complaining about it, right? Um, and, 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 and I think that's a really important point here where some of that resiliency kind of comes in, into here. It can help play with, with AQ, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're thriving if you're constantly being resistant or resilient. So those are the characteristics we talked about of high, high adaptable people. So you might be thinking, and you got your score, so you might be thinking, well, how do, how do I get better at this, right? Better, how do I grow? How do I grow my adaptability? It's not a fixed state. Um, well, it's not as easy as snails growing legs, or maybe, it, it, or maybe it's as hard as snails growing legs. I love this slide more than anything, so I, <laughs> I have forced myself to inject it into this, <laughs> into this talk. <laughs> I think it worked, I think I nailed it. Um, okay, so the first thing that you're gonna do if you wanna increase your adaptability is change awareness. Um, you have to make an intentional effort to be aware of the change and engage in it. You have to know it's a thing and then engage in it. And in other words, you can't adapt to change you can't see. Change happens whether you're seeking it out or not. And adaptability is about embracing that change and not letting it destroy our ability to perform. Uh, and I think it's important not only from a psychological standpoint, but from also from an ID and product creation standpoint. Ask yourself, what's the relationship here? What's different? Keep your ear to the ground and kind of hear what people are talking about, right? If you had your ear to the ground a year and a half ago, you would have, de you, you, you would have definitely already been aware of all the, the great, fantastic AI capabilities that are out there and, all, and well, well versed on the tools by now. So this is the point where you want to use your change energy and be like water to adapt. So once, once you realize that there's change and you're like, great, um, 
Let's do it. Let's struggle. Let's, let's get uncomfortable. The next thing that you can do is to increase your cognitive flexibility. So before we get into what that means, let's do an activity to see how that feels. You guys game? I heard hell yeah. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to give you, there are three sets of numbers up here. And I want you to put into Menti or shout out what you think the pattern is on these three, this number set. And when you do, I'm going to say yes or no. Increasing numbers, doubling, the increasing by one. Double first number and one to second number. Yeah, these are common. Look at that algebra. Who said you would never use it? <laughs> What's that last one? Integers. <laughs> OK, so if we go scroll up to the, the first one, uh, this has never happened. Uh, so kudos to whoever said this. Uh, increasing numbers. Uh, that was the pattern. Um, so <laughs> you blew my activity, uh, which is great. Um, so one of the things about this is if we go back. I love that this happened. Um, so I've done this activity, I don't know, like 20 times. Uh, this is the first time it ever happened to me, so it's fantastic. Um, so what's really interesting about this is usually people say double the number and add one, right? That, that, that's the first pattern fit, so thus it must be the best pattern, right? Wrong. Um, and so when we talk about cognitive flexibility, we're really talking about making sure that we don't fall into this trap, and a lot of experts fall into this trap. Uh, where we get entrenched thinking and we think first pattern fit is best pattern fit. And if I was up here to tell you that most of the, the answers on this were wrong, you would be like, oh, great, it's just double another plus one. And then six months from now when we release this product or launch something, guess what? It'd be a big fail, right? Um, and so one of the things that we really want to think about when we're when we're thinking about how do we be better at adaptability is really flex uh, your cognitive muscles and, and make and stretch them a little bit more. So think about things differently, really probe that system. What used to be is probably not what it currently is. So you really need to throw out some of your old entrenched patterns of thinking. And that leads us to this next piece. Or actually, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, so this whole like first pattern fit versus best pattern fit is something that I see in a lot of experts and a lot of consultant agencies as well. Um, and to, to, to be better, we really have to stretch our thinking and say there are no crazy ideas, right? When we say no crazy ideas, we mean we're throwing out those constraints that we think are setting us back. And so when you loosen constraints, you get more possibilities. So let's just imagine uh, that we're a, a bookseller operating out of our garage, right? And then what if I played the what if game and said, um, uh, what if I could ship anything that people wanted to their homes and have shipping costs be a non-issue, a non-constraint? What, what would we have? Amazon, yeah, yeah. Or Sears back in, in the, the way back days. So let, let's, let's take a moment to reflect on that. You might not be old enough to remember when two-day shipping wasn't a thing, when you were online and your, your choice, the uh, factor of your choice was how long the shipping was or how much the shipping was, right, before, before two-day delivery. A negative determining factor for your shopping selection. Um, and it was just easier to go to the store um, than to hop online. So just recently, I was preparing for a trip and I didn't have some, some sunscreen, I think it was. Um, and I went online and I was going to like go to Amazon and, and order it. And I was like, oh, it's not going to get here before my trip. And I was like, what am I going to do? I'm not going to have sunscreen. Um, like I literally forgot I could go to the store and pick up sunscreen. That's the impact. That's the long-term outcome of cognitive flexibility. Like say what you will about Jeff Bezos. And I say a lot, believe me, I don't use Amazon anymore. Um, but he made shipping a non-issue, a non-constraint. And that's huge. 
Jeff played the what if game. He loosened constraints. He explored those possibilities. And now we all can get toilet paper delivered to our house with just a push of a button, unless it was like 2020 and then we can, <laughs> no toilet paper for anyone. <laughs> All right, so the first thing, third thing that you're gonna do is focused attention. Um, and uh, that's where we're gonna be aware of the change. We're probing to see where the, see, see what possibilities are there. Now it's time to focus on what we can unlearn, right? It's, adaptability isn't just about learning new things, it's about figuring out what's obsolete information that you do not need to know anymore. So again, let's take a look at what that might feel like. And at this point, I tend to lose some people in the audience because they're like, you did a little dirty trick on, on, on the last exercise. Uh, this is it's all part of the experience, so I encourage you to, to engage in, in yet another activity here. And I want you to name the days of the week in, order, in the order that they appear. Just do number one first and put that in the chat. The starting point is wherever you would like the starting point to be. I realize there are two different agreed upon starting points. But I love the specifics. <laughs> so name the days of the week in the order that they appear. For you, again, if you wanna start Sunday, cool. If you wanna start Monday, that's cool too. All right, most people if all people know the days of the week in the order that they appear. And you guys did it really quickly. Great job. Now, what I want you to do is name the days of the week alphabetically. Oh, that's right. Okay, you probably can't um, do that because uh, I changed my talk like right before <laughs> this. So I... Okay, um, so maybe you can, maybe you can't. <laughs> but the point here is, uh, oftentimes when I ask this question, I'll do the first one. I usually have it on two separate slides, but I like to, to make things really stressful for myself and change things right before my talk um, because adaptability. <laughs> and so uh, oftentimes when I say do an alphabetical order, people sigh. They, they'll flat out tell me no. Uh, they'll put their phone down. Uh, they just, they won't engage anymore. And why is that? You have to think. You ha it's harder, yeah. Why is it harder? You're just used to saying them in a certain way. So you have to unlearn the old way of saying things and relearn Friday, Monday, Saturday, Sunday, Thursday, Tuesday, th Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? And I have it written down here and it's really hard for me. You have to unlearn that. It's really similar to if I asked you to uh, say the alphabet without singing the song. Can you say the alphabet without singing the song? I know I can't. I cannot say the alphabet without singing um, that melody. So we have, to, we have to put our old way of viewing aside and look at things differently. We have to focus our intention on creating new possibilities and giving up any kind of constraints. You need to unlearn these old patterns you fall into so you can learn some new ways of doing things. You have to, un you, have, you know, what can you do to unlearn to exploit the possible? What can you unlearn to be behave differently? Again, we're gonna have to do this with generative AI. Um, we're gonna have to unlearn that uh, a computer cannot be your coworker, right? We're gonna have to unlearn partnering with your computer and corresponding with your computer in a natural speaking tone and asking them questions. Is, is okay, it's not cheating, it's not plagiarism. Um, and another example of this is that we have to unlearn figuring, like if we're, go, if we're switching from in a classic project management um, uh, way of working to a more of an iterative, iterative way of working, we have to unlearn how to think about all the things ahead of time. We have to unlearn that efficiency and productivity are a thing, that green statuses and executing the plan is a successful project right? Success value is not de delivered, um, or we have to relearn delivery value is the thing. All right, so I gave you a number of different tools and, and, and tricks um, for ways to, to uh, increase your adaptability. So let's walk through this a little bit. Um, 
So the next time someone doesn't respond to your email or you have to engage in a new tech stack or somebody brings up AI again and you've, you've kind of gotten out of the, oh my gosh, uh, overwhelmness, I want you to, to, to think about this, right? Think about how you can be like water, how you can adapt to change and the environments around you. So again, the first thing you're gonna do is you have to be aware that there's a change. In order to in, engage in it, you have to communicate and interact with your environment to look for possible alternatives. The second thing is you wanna have um, cognitive flexibility. You know, I, one of the ways I like to think about this is how a kid might tackle a problem, right? How might a kid approach solving a situation like a company acquisition with having suddenly 300 new, new um, coworkers? Would they run up to the first person they meet and say, let's be friends and give them a hug? Now, I'm not necessarily encouraging you to do that or, or suggesting that I have done that, but I did take a kid approach, right? Where I went to them and said, just kind of let down boundaries, let down my mask, say, hey, I'm a human, um, and, and it, engage in, in learning how, how, to, how to embrace suddenly 300 new coworkers. And lastly, it's about focused attention. What are you gonna unlearn? I don't think we do this enough as people and as organizations. Really focus on what you're gonna unlearn. If you're learning something new, what are you forgetting? You might need to unlearn that you think, so let's say, you, let's say you're part of this acquisition or you're joining a new team. Maybe you need to unlearn that so-and-so is a jerk. I know I've had to do that. Anybody else have to unlearn somebody's a jerk? It's really great. It's actually a really great skill to have, uh, but it's really, ch it's really challenging. Um, uh, and so one of the things that I think is important, I gave you a lot of tools. I, I, I went through them relatively quickly, um, but take your time with this. This is hard. Adaptability is hard. Print this out, keep this up. Next time you're experiencing change, try and go through one of these, um, these activities, uh, just to help build that muscle memory of how you can respond to, to change. Um, I, again, it may feel like a lot, but you're building a new muscle, a new skill set potentially, or executing one that you've already built, just kind of flexing it a little bit and needing a reminder. And so I'm really excited to be able to have shared all this knowledge um, and my experience with adaptability with you today. Um, but before we head out into the world of GoTo, I want to remind us that, one, you got this, right? Everyone's got this. I think we could all... <laughs> All use a reminder of that. I also want us to remind us that we're human beings, not human doings. I love that quote. We're human beings, not human doings. We aren't against it. I'm not suggesting that you smile through these changes. The point isn't to smile through the change, right? The point is to thrive. The point is to work through your feelings, pause and reflect, evaluate where you're at in the spectrum of adaptability, and use these tools that we went over today to grow and harness your adaptability. Um, so if you're curious about adapt adaptability, you're curious about how you need a sounding board related to a change, or maybe you have a change coming up with one of your clients or a coworker, or you're feeling some doubt or some um, anxiety. Uh, I'm a big nerd, uh, and I love to talk about this and, and other, other items. I'm doing a table talk with team and inclusion today, if you want to join me there. Um, but my QR code to my LinkedIn is right there if you'd like to connect and nerd out. Also, um, I'm not only passionate about adaptability, I also nerd out on metrics, measuring the right thing in the right time. I'm so passionate about it and think that organizations do it, a lot of organizations do it poorly, that I wrote uh, along with my uh, colleague, Angela Dugan, a little book on metrics that talks about why we measure it, how we measure it, and the right questions to ask, the right curious questions to ask when you're looking at flat metrics and how not to uh, view them in a vacuum. Um, if you don't have, if you can't get your phone to pull this up, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn and I can share it with you. Wow. <laughs>